everybody and a very good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, so thank you very much for coming along to this webinar, an introduction to teaching and assessment for medical educators, a brand new online program from Epigeum. We should be taking about 45 minutes of your time today, including an opportunity for a designated answer and question session at the end. Um, if you are familiar with the GoToMeeting software that we are using, you might know that there is a questions option as part of the panel on the right-hand side of your screen near the bottom. If you would like to ask questions as and when they occur to you, please feel free to type them up and send them over via the pane there, and we're quite happy to take those as we're going through. We'll also be making a recording of the webinar available as well, so if you wish to view it again or share it with your colleagues, that will be an option for you. This will be available early next week. At the moment, you're all on mute because the feedback can sometimes affect the quality of the sound, so if you do have any questions or issues you would like to raise, please do so in the question pane. That's part of the GoToMeeting program setup on the right-hand side of your screen. So firstly, just a couple of introductions. Um, that's me, Sarah Vaughan, on the right-hand side. I work for Epigeum, the organization that puts together the online courses, and I look after the webinars as well. A large part of my role is looking after our collaboration and implementation workshops, as well as our product launches and online events such as this. I'll let Tessa in the middle and Ed on the far left introduce themselves now. Hi, I'm Tessa. I was the project editor on the TAME program, and I worked closely with Ed. Hi, and I'm, I will be saying a little bit more about myself later on. So just to look at the agenda before we get started, um, first we'll look at Epigeum itself. We're the organization that puts together the programs through a collaborative model, which is quite unique, and I will show you a short video that explains how this approach works. Then Ed will give you an overview of the teaching and assessment for medical educators program, in which he will discuss the vision he had as lead advisor. This will be followed by a demonstration of the courses by Tessa Dagley and finally a question and answer session. So a little bit about Epigeum. Um, we were founded in 2005 as a spin-out originally from Imperial College London. Our two founders created the company in response to what they felt was a lack of timely support for researchers. One of our founders was doing a PhD at the time and he came across issues that he wanted and needed to be advised on. And it would be either that there would be a face-to-face -face course in three months' time that was being offered or that there was inadequate material online that didn't quite fit what he needed. So he saw this as an opportunity to work with universities to create supported materials for researchers, particularly PhD students and postdocs like himself, that gave just-in-time support for all those issues. And that's where we started, in this sort of research arena within the higher education sector. In the 10 years since, we have expanded to studying programs, courses for students, and teaching programs as well, programs for staff, of which this is one of. We were acquired by Oxford University Press in May of this year. Oxford University Press are actually a division of Oxford University, so we're still within the not-for-profit organization in a higher education context, and still very much focused on creating high-quality materials. To date, in the decade since we have been formed, we have created over 78 online courses across 12 different programs, and we have currently seven in development. The program Teaching and Assessment for Medical Educators is our latest program to publish. We're an increasingly globally focused organization and have worked with over 260 universities across 29 different countries worldwide to date. This is enough to show you what countries we have been involved with in the development of our courses. Um, so this is just a short video to give you an idea of how we develop our programs. It's only a couple minutes long, so I'll just let this play for a bit. The story of an FHP course. We come up with an idea, and we consult widely to develop and fine-tune it. We commission a team of expert authors to write it, and a team of expert reviewers to help them. We commission a lead advisor who gives strategic vision and leadership. And we bring together a team of universities who form a development group to give feedback on our plans and prototypes and to make sure the product meets their needs. The collaborations we build are drawn from across the world and often involve input from over 50 academics as well as our team of in-house specialists. Because we believe that collaboration and integration are the key to producing truly innovative and effective products. So we bring everyone together for a launch workshop at the start of each project. It's a great mixing pot where the creative juices can flow and expertise can be shared. We provide a week-long training course for our writing team to make sure they're able to get the best out of the online medium. 
and we provide plenty of opportunities for sampling and feedback along the way through a detailed peer review process. In fact, a typical product goes through at least five iterations before it's ready to be built by our in-house developers. Together, we're more than the sum of our parts, and our unique and rigorous product development process gives all collaborators access to groundbreaking courses they couldn't have created alone. Here's what some of our customers have to say. Our products are used by over 200 institutions in 25 different countries. To find out more about the collaborations we're currently building, click on the Next Steps button or get in touch with us direct. We'd love to work with you. Um, so just to summarize the content of the video you have seen, um, here's a couple of bullet points I just wanted to cover. So the development group of up to 20 universities come together and share their experience at a workshop to help us create a really great online course. We recruit authors all under the guidance of a lead advisor. In this case of this program we are discussing today, that would be Professor Ed Peel. The lead advisor is the person who has the expertise in the area who can lead and shape the vision for the program. We have a meticulous review process in place which allows the development group to look at the content of the courses, check that it matches their expectations and comment on it as well. Thus the development group of universities are the early adopters who get to use the program and implement them at their universities and then we make it available to other universities on a license basis, which is what we are now able to do with the completed program for teaching and assessment for medical educators. So hopefully that gives you a bit of background to GM and how we put the programs together. I'd be happy to take any questions on that process, but for now I'll hand over to Professor Ed Peel to talk to you about the foundations of the program and his vision for it. Thank you very much, um, and good morning from me to everybody. It's been a great pleasure for me to be the advisor on this program. And uh, I thought I'd start by just saying a little bit about myself, where I come from, and what led me to develop this program. So my background, I started more years ago than I, I'd like to remember at, at a London teaching hospital called the Middlesex Hospital, which is no longer with us. And there, one of the things I took away, much though I enjoyed my medical training, I did revolt against the uh, practice of, of the teaching by humiliation, which was common in those days, and um, I really that started with the idea there must be better ways of teaching that improve patient care. I then spent uh, several years in in pediatrics, working the hours that one worked in those days, uh, which again got in the way of learning, but it taught me something about how uh, medical education uh, is needs to happen in those moments which are precious in the middle of clinical practice. I spent several years on the mobile dialysis unit in the Royal Air Force and then I went into uh, a short time in pharmaceutical research but found that I really missed patient care and patient care has been at the center of what I've done since then. I started my own general practice it started with just me and no patients, and nowadays it's uh, got 28,000 patients across uh, three practices. I haven't been working in the practice for some years now, but I take great pride in what's happened there, and I keep in touch with general practice across the UK as part of the appraisal program. My midlife crisis was to go and do my doctorate in education at Oxford because I realized that teaching was really a very central part of what I believed in, in medical education, the fact that one can have so much more impact on so many clinicians working across the, the health service if one can, pays attention to the teaching and learning. And since I retired from being the Dean for Education, the, the um, head of the Institute of Clinical Education at the University of Warwick, I'm still an emeritus professor there, but I've concentrated on service development in undergraduate and postgraduate education. C 
So uh, basically, why this course? I really felt that this was a problem that needs solving. That in my time as as uh, lead for education at Warwick, I realised that. Um, one of the major problems was that although you can be quite confident that everybody who teaches on the university campus has been trained to teach, you have a huge workforce out there who are teaching medical students and how on earth can you be sure that they're adequately trained to deliver the teaching? In our case, there was a university teaching hospital, several district general hospitals, other hospitals like psychiatric hospitals and a large number of general practices, all of which are teaching and generally teaching to a very high standard. But when the regulators ask you to demonstrate how these uh, teachers have been taught, it's often difficult. So clinical teaching is not covered in the university's academic program. That's one of the problems. And the second problem is that it's not, we're not covered in medical training. We're not taught very much about the uh, education. So I regard our clinical teachers as a very hard to reach workforce. I mentioned how the hospitals, the general practices are scattered in my case, up to 50 miles away, medical students are taught. And that's not unusual in the UK. The clinical teachers have diverse clinical roles. They work in all the main medical uh, specialities. And of course, the acute care specialities have different ways of organizing their workplace um, than some of the other specialities. But all of them are time pressurized and they're prioritizing patient care. So delivery of faculty development, in other words, becoming a better teacher, is often a very difficult area. And finally, people are working in shift systems. It's difficult to synchronize the fa faculty development programs. And all that led me to believe that one of the best ways of uh, reaching this workforce was by a program such as the Epigeum program, which can be accessed by clinicians in different areas at different times in different ways. So, we come on to clinical teaching and learning, and here's my model. Um, it's a fairly universal model, but the first thing that students start with is learning about people, learning the human sciences. And I do believe that those who teach the human sciences need also to have contact with the clinical teachers, and I hope that some of them will enjoy and get something from the teaching uh, that we're talking about, which is the clinical learning and teaching, because I think if they understand more of that, they will teach it better. There is often a very strong collaboration between uh, the social scientists and the biomedical scientists and the clinicians when it comes to helping students learn about patients. And again, I hope both workforces will find this sort of common resource a useful one. We then come on to what is probably the focus of this program, which is learning with patients. Notice my underlining there. Really, uh, I, I firmly believe that the patient has a real role in the teaching that we deliver. And you'll find that emphasized in the courses I've written, so that you can see how clinical decision making becomes a cooperative activity with patients. And I think that the clinicians who learn about this will benefit. The final stage of learning is when the trained doctor has responsibility for patients, for developing the art and science of practice. And I here uh, want to say that I believe that what we learn about clinical teaching extends across the student teaching to the teaching of people who are in the trainee postgraduate stage. I think that many of postgraduate teachers will get something useful out of the course that we've developed. So, the target audience that I have in mind is these various people. The social scientists, the biomedical scientists, 
non-doctors as well as doctors, because I believe that the non-doctor workforce is making a hugely important contribution to our clinical education. People working in different situations, from theatre to seminar room, and also the, um, the one thing I would like to emphasize is that uh, at the heart, the connection across everybody who's teaching is the patient. The patient is at the heart of the teaching, and although they're not a target audience of this program, they are at the heart of what we've written and what, what people are learning about. So, what is the theoretical underpinning of what we talk about? The first thing I'd like to emphasize is constructive alignment. I think it's one thing that clinicians often don't understand fully enough is that the learning and teaching activities have to be directed at specific learning outcomes and that what we assess assesses the outcomes as well. This alignment, which is probably so well known to university teachers, is not very well known to clinicians sometimes. And the other thing that clinicians don't always remember is that when they're doing assessments, it's, it's not all about the student in front of them at that stage. They have to think about the whole cohort of students. They have to think about the concepts of reliability, of fairness, of reproducibility, so that the assessments are robust and will stand up. So I find it very useful to introduce the concept of programmatic assessment. But throughout a medical student's course, there is a program of coherent assessment that we build up evidence points all the way through, made up of not only of the summative education, but also of the formative assessments whereby the students have built their learning. So, how do you make best use of the course that we have developed for? The first thing I, I hope is that you as educational leaders will familiarize yourselves with the content, that you will want to customize the tutor activities for your own institution. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to do this. You may well wish to accredit the learning yourselves so that you can then uh, offer your faculty, your clinicians, and your other teachers an accreditation in teaching and assessment. And I certainly hope that you will track the people who have completed the course because this will give you the uh, thing I was talking about in the beginning, the information that you can demonstrate that people have engaged with a specific training in teaching and learning medical education. And I hope you'll use this as a foundation for your faculty development and build on it. So uh, that's really what I wanted to say. We're at the end of my slides, so I think I'll hand back now to the uh, team of Pigeon to move on to the demonstration. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, Tess is going to now give a demonstration of the course. Um, just a reminder to everybody, please feel free to type up your questions in the questions pane, and we will address them in the question and answer session at the end. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Ed. Okay, now I'll just go start on this screen here. First, this is how the programme will look on our hosted system. Most universities, however, choose to host it in their own uh, VLE or LMS. Now, to give you an idea of some of the programme's features, let's start by looking at a screen in the course on clinical teaching and learning. At the top of every screen, we have a learning outcome. This indicates what is going to be covered in the screen and what participants should have learned or should be able to do after completing that screen. Also here, we have an estimated duration, here eight minutes, so that students have an idea of how long it is likely to take to work through the screen. 
These estimates include time to watch videos and complete activities in the central section of every screen. Screens vary in length throughout the programme. Now on the right hand side of many of the course screens, there are little clickable boxes, or as we refer to them, pods, containing extra information about the main screen content, as well as activities, documents to download, definitions of key terms, and links to further reading. Here on this screen, the first pod is a quotation pod. Throughout the course, there are quotations from real patients, students, and experts. These are often followed by a question to consider in order to encourage participants to reflect on the topics mentioned. Underneath, there's a useful resources pod. These resources might be relevant books, articles or web links which complement the on-screen content and which provide participants with more in-depth information. At this point, it is worth pointing out the Your Context pod. These pods encourage participants to find out more about their own context, for example, the expectations or guidelines at their own institution, or the support available within their own department. They are customizable, which means that institutions can insert their own information into the pods, and for this reason we keep our text fairly generic. Here, for instance, institutions might want to insert links to their own website, their own handbook or curriculum, anything that details information on patient cases. You will notice that many of the screens also have icons on the right hand side. These symbols indicate ongoing themes which are explained in the introduction screen of each course. Here we have a support icon. This symbol appears wherever the screen content refers to the importance of providing learners of all levels with the necessary help and assistance. Just returning to screen 1C. You'll see an example of the high quality video footage that features throughout the programme. Some of the videos are interviews with cl clinician educators and or students as seen here. Providing interesting anecdotes and useful advice, these clips prompt participants to think about their own teaching and learning experiences, to question their own methods and to realise that they are not alone, that their peers experience the same concerns. In this video, a very experienced educator discusses how he supports a learner who has to deliver bad news to a patient. Now, under each video, we have a transcript for accessibility purposes. I'll just point out here that on every screen has a text print version. Uh, this is the counterpart containing flat text. Um, and they're compatible, these printable versions are compatible with screen readers and useful for those who are unable to use the interactive version for any reason. Other videos besides the interviews include scenarios. These are realistic clinical scenarios and often require participants to reflect on a realistic situation. So on this screen we have uh, a video with uh, first encounters with patients, so two learners who um, are encountering patients for the first time, and then an hour later, a debrief. Activities in the programme fall into two categories, interactive and presentational. Presentational activities are used to present key subject matter in an engaging and attractive way, rather than simply as flat text. On this screen, on indirect working with patients, also in the course Clinical Teaching and Learning, we have two comic strips. These portray two different ways of treating a patient via an interpreter, one poor way followed by a more exemplary approach. Another presentational activity on this screen is the ladder steps. This explains the skills needed when conducting a telephone consultation. Interactive activities, on the other hand, require the participant to do something, whether this be entering text in response to a question, matching items or putting items in order, and so on. Let me move on to course two, clinical assessment, feedback and evaluation, to show you some examples. At the beginning of this second course, we have inserted a self-assessment tool, 
which prompts participants to both reflect on their own abilities and confidence and to increase their awareness of the professional standards of the Academy of Medical Educators. Participants can click through each item and depending on their answers they will receive tailored feedback at the end which will classify them at a certain level as, uh, as stated by the Academy of Medical Educators. For example here. Hopefully by the end of the course participants will feel that they have improved and enhanced their current skills. Other exciting interactive activities can be found on this screen in course 2 on alignment. The first activity has been designed as an alignment board. Participants are asked to imagine that they are working on a surgical curriculum for junior doctors. They have to consider the four proposed learning outcomes and identify the form of assessment marked on the left of the grid. Consider which assessment might best align with each outcome. They are required to click on each square. Ideal matches turn green, near matches turn amber and mismatches turn red. Further down this screen you will find a checklist ticking cross activity. Here participants have to decide whether or not each collection of learning outcomes, teaching strategies and assessment is well aligned. Again, feedback is provided under each item. Before moving on to other features, I'll quickly show you just some of the other different kinds of activities available in our courses. In this paint activity, participants have to consider the pros and cons of technology. And further down, we have another example of a presentational activity, a word cloud. Again, defining key terms. We hope that by presenting course content in different ways, we can help keep the material fresh, digestible and fun. Staying on this screen, right at the bottom, you will see that there is a portfolio activity. These portfolio activities appear in pods throughout the course and are core features of the TAME programme. They provide participants with opportunities to develop their learning, to develop their knowledge of the content in the main screen by doing extra offline tasks. Word documents are provided to allow the user to keep a record of their work. There is also an option to download all of these portfolio activities in one collected document. This portfolio, portfolio is downloadable from the introduction screen of the, both courses. It is up to the participant to decide whether they wish to download everything at the beginning or to simply download as and when it suits them. Finally, at the end of each course, participants are given the opportunity to consolidate their new skills and knowledge by completing an interactive series of questions based on a clinical teaching scenario. Here in this course, participants follow Dr. Kate Bridger, a practitioner who has reached the final two years of her paediatrics training and hopes to get a permanent post at the University Teaching Hospital. The practice scenario is followed by a course summary, a resource bank and a references screen. Any useful resources mentioned throughout the course, in the, particularly in the useful resource pods, have been collated here. And all citations in the main text have been compiled in the reference screen that follows, follows this one. We hope that participants take the opportunity to explore the topics in more detail. The very last screen on every course is the course quiz. Now these multiple choice quizzes are the default assessment mode, testing both completion of the course and understanding. The quizzes are provided in a format that will allow institutions to add and remove questions after the courses have been installed in their BLE or their LMS. I hope I have given you a good taste of the programme content and some of the pedagogical features with this demonstration. If you have any questions, please do note them down now or feel free to contact Apogeum after the webinar. Thanks, Tessa.
Um, if you have any questions, please do type them in the questions pane now. I'll just have a look to see uh, what questions we have so far. Okay, um, a couple of questions for you, Ed. Uh, why are you only covering teaching and assessment in these courses? Right, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think as the central uh, items of learning about medical education, I think these are the, 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 the main pillars. So if the, the teaching and the assessment are the two areas that you want to assure competence for all clinical teachers. But throughout what we've done, I, I mentioned the constructive align, alignment such that everything depends on the learning outcomes. The, the curriculum has learning outcomes identified and the teaching is directed at, at, at helping the learning outcomes be achieved and the assessment is, is seeing if, if, if that's happened. But I believe that with our emphasis on that and also on programmatic assessment, we've, we've used every opportunity to try to get clinicians thinking wider about the education activity they're part of. At times we talk about the selection, the selection of students for courses or the selection of trainees for programs. We do talk about the faculty development angle and we do talk about quality improvement uh, and evaluation. They, are, they may not be the main topics of the two courses but they are referred to, and I do hope they provide hooks on which the clinician will build their educational knowledge as they go through. Um, thanks, Ed. We have another question um, which asks, how can I access this program from my location? Um, all our courses are online, so you would be able to access them through our um, Epigeum portal, which uh, Tessa showed you in the demonstration, or you will be able to download them to your own LMS or BLE and provide students access through that. I hope that answers your question. Um, if that's not very clear, please do follow up with an email and I'd be more than happy to get um, one of my expert colleagues to get back to you with further details on technical support. Could I add to that, sir, if possible? Yeah, of course. Um, one of the issues that um, the those responsible for faculty development in uh, medical schools and training centers have is, is that sometimes the people who are actually doing the clinical teaching, being in different organizations, have different email and so on. So, for instance, in the, the UK university will have their own website, their own virtual learning environment, as you refer to, but the clinicians who are teaching may be part of different organizations and in particular part of the NHS. Now this is a problem that we've recognized and can easily get round uh, by means of uh, getting passwords onto it for all your uh, clinicians. So it should be that this distributed learning will be able to be available to all the learners that you, you want to, to learn from the program. Thanks, Ed. Um, just a couple more questions for you. What is the limitation of patient-based clinical teaching due to the evolution of patient ethics, modesty, and safety? Right. Um, I love that question. I, I think that um, in, in the uh, learning with patients area, in fact, one of the titles I, we, we sort of toyed with earlier on was, was, was learning and teaching with patients. The emphasis is very much on this patient partnership. And you'll find that there are screens on uh, actually consenting patients, on informing patients, on be helping the patients to become better involved in the teaching enterprise, thinking about patient feedback, uh, its role. Uh, and that really is a central tenet of, of the clinical teaching. Because unless clinical teaching is involving and is truly ethical and informing, then uh, I don't believe uh, it will ever be effective in, in any clinical environment. So we do talk quite a lot about that and I hope you'll find that that 
caters by starting from the principles of uh, collaboration with our patients, it will cater for that very well. Thanks, Ed. One more question for you. Um, in what way medical simulation is going to help the clinical educators in teaching undergraduate and postgraduate trainees? I, I think enormously. Um, I haven't talked a lot about um, simulation in this um, in the programs. It comes in very much into assessment in looking at um, where uh, simulated assessments um, are more effective than real patient assessments, etc. But my belief is that by focusing on real patient uh, teaching, that, that the simulated teaching, which has to go hand in hand with the real patient teaching, will become apparent. We talk a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer teaching, we talk a little bit about simulation, but it, 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 I have to say it's, it's not a, a major focus because different teaching enterprises have, have such different simulation activities at their base. I think it's a lovely example of where you can customize your tutoring around your own simulation facilities at your institution. Thanks, Ed. Um, just one more final question for you. Um, and how to collaborate with patients, especially in teaching in private uh, or corporate hospitals? Right. Um, I think that uh, this issue of, t of collaborating with patients in, in private hospitals it all comes down to the quality of our work. If we work really effectively with our patients, they enjoy the teaching. They get a lot from it. They can see the value of it. And um, therefore, they want to participate in it. Um, so I believe that the more skilled clinicians become at involving patients teaching with the patients, giving the patients the, the, the proper feedback about how this activity is helping, what it's actually doing to develop the doctors of the future, then I think the patients want to do it. The time when patients don't want to be taught on is when it's a, a rushed, poorly done uh, activity uh, and um, it can almost feel abusive of, of patients if it's not done properly. So that's why we place such an emphasis on developing effective patient teaching. And my experience is that patients in private hospitals welcome uh, well done uh, teaching with patients. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. And thank you to all the participants who have been asking questions today. Um, so on my screen now you can see my colleague Wendy Harbottle's contact details. Some of you may have already been in touch with her in regards to this program. And that's her email address and telephone number. Wendy can give you a lot more detail in regards to pricing and also provide you with a free trial if you would like to get a feel for the course before committing to a purchase. We will send out a recording of this presentation to you so you can share it with the relevant colleagues who may find this of interest. So thank you very much for attending this webinar today. Again, please feel free to drop us an email if you have any questions or contact Wendy for further information regarding pricing and free trial. Thank you very much.